Thank you, Senators, very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Senator Serino. The American Council of Trustees and Alumni is honored and privileged to be part of this important conference, a summit perhaps, I should call it. Uh, we have been at this game for 28 years, doing everything we can to help colleges and universities initiate and see through the kind of positive, enduring changes that strengthen higher education. And we are completely at your service in helping you to do the really important and difficult work that boards of trustees have to do. Just a fun fact about the American Council of Trustees and Alumni, its initials, ACTA or ACTA, actually form a Latin word which means things accomplished. And for today, for this panel, we're taking up a topic that is front and center for what colleges and universities have to accomplish. And that's urgent because the nation is impatient with the shoutdowns, the cancellations, the silencing, the deplatforming of all those speakers who are not aligned with campus orthodoxies. And we are very, very grateful to Senator Serino for his vision in advancing legislation to enhance intellectual diversity and for convening us today in this important forum. And I also want to thank Chancellor Gardner for raising the issue of American history and civic education. Professor Dunn will be talking a little bit today about how intellectual diversity is an engine through which we come to understand our history and the challenges of our nation better. And so a word about trustees. Um, you have an extraordinary heritage of brave predecessors. And just to inspire you, here are some of them. Patrick Henry, James Madison, Ben Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, John Dickinson, Benjamin Rush. So I, I want to channel a little bit of President Huffman in urging you to be bold, uh, to take the reins of institutions that really need leadership. Ohio and the nation are counting on your leadership. To say that our nation is badly fractured is an understatement. Uh, and one thing I want to stress, it's not a partisan statement. In fact, recognizing the polarization of our nation, the erosion of intellectual diversity, the breakdown of civil discourse, is one of the few topics on which we actually have bipartisan agreement. Kind of sad to think about that. Higher education has to play a much better part than it has in recent years in applying the remedies. About two years ago, those of you who are steady readers of The Economist of London may recall, I'm going to quote them. I can't do the British accent, but I'll just read it in my own American patois. As young graduates have taken jobs in the upmarket media and in politics, business, and education, they have brought with them a horror of feeling, quote, unsafe, and an agenda obsessed with a narrow vision of obtaining justice for oppressed identity groups. They have also brought along tactics to enforce ideological purity by no platforming their enemies and canceling allies who have transgressed." End of quote. Is this really the America that we want? The America that we want to project to the world? I, I still wince when our, our, our friends from across the pond have such things to say about America. Are our colleges and universities preparing graduates for a free society in which debate and disagreement are at its core, the engines of progress and improvement? The task before us is to mend our flaws, and the remedies are also before us. We need only the will to apply them, and that's where brave and bold and selfless trustees come in. This is, of course, your responsibility, and you can channel Senator Serino for taking some of the heat, because there will be some heat and some pushback. But you have the authority to take up the measures that we need. 
And we're going to get splendid guidance from this panel on what intellectual diversity means and how to foster and protect it. Their bios are in your packet. Uh, I'm grateful and in awe that we have these four eminent scholars and teachers with us. Two of these speakers received ACTA's Hero of Intellectual Freedom Award for their unblinking, unwavering defense of those core principles of the academy, pursuit of truth, reliance on evidence, and the cultivation of merit and excellence. And they are Joshua Dunn, Executive Director of the Institute of American Civics at the Howard H. Baker School for Public Policy and Public Affairs at the University of Tennessee. He's come to the University of Tennessee recently from the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, where he chaired the political science department. He will be followed by Professor Vincent Philip Munoz, the Tocqueville Professor of Political Science and the concurrent professor of law at the University of Notre Dame. Professor Munoz is the founding director of the Center for Citizenship and Constitutional Government at Notre Dame. Next, we have Professor Eric Smith, Associate Professor of Rhetoric at York College of Pennsylvania, a research fellow at the Cato Institute, and the co-founder of Free Black Thought. Professor Smith received from ACTA the Hero of Intellectual Freedom Award in 2022. And he will be followed by the winner of ACTA's Hero of Intellectual Freedom Award in 2021. Dr. Dorian Abbott is Associate Professor of Geophysical Sciences at the University of Chicago. Our panelists will speak in that order, then discuss with each other some of the central issues concerning intellectual diversity, but we're gonna leave extensive time for your questions. Thank you all so much for being with us today. Professor Dunn. Thank you so much, Michael, and thank you to Senator Serino as well. It's just an honor to be here and to be with all of you. So I'll try to keep my comments brief so we have, uh, and I think all of us want to do that, so that we have plenty of time for discussion and questions from you. But I want to discuss why viewpoint diversity is essential for the university to accomplish its two core missions of teaching and research, and then also how these are often related to civic education. After all, I'm directing an institute on American civics, and so I think there is a connection there. But then conclude with some thoughts about why that cannot occur without the work of those of you in this room. It is going to require external influence. It's not going to come so much from within the, the university or uh, from faculty, but it's going to require action from boards of trustees in the state, state legislature. So first of all, teaching. I think this is the primary mission of the university. Uh, to teach the next generation and transmit knowledge to them. I don't think the university can accomplish this mission with, without some, some viewpoint diversity, and also, very importantly, to prepare them to live in a pluralistic democracy like ours when they leave. After all these students, they can go to college. Uh, if they don't confront ideas that they uh, are going to confront outside of college, it might be an unpleasant and unnerving experience for them. Uh, they might get used to the idea that they are, in fact, entitled to never confront ideas that they find unpleasant and displeasing, and this is simply not the case. Now, you might doubt whether or not this is actually true, uh, but I'm just gonna give you one anecdote that I think captures this. So I'm gonna tell you about Jonathan Heights. How many of you have heard of Jonathan Heights? Uh, I've got some required reading for the rest of you. Uh, so this comes from his book, uh, The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. But you should also read a book that he co-authored called The Coddling of the American Mind, written uh, with Greg Lukianoff that also captures some of the struggles that our students today are, are confronting. So here's Jonathan Heights. Uh, he describes how he was already a tenured professor at the University of Virginia, had gone to some of our most distinguished institutions. Uh, he actually got, he's a social psychologist. He went into psychology, as he'll tell you, to help elect Democrats. That was his goal. Uh, he, he wanted to learn about how the mind functions so they can help Democrats win elections. So he's already a tenured professor. He goes into a used bookstore in Charlottesville, Virginia, uh, and he discovers something shocking to him. There's a book there, edited by Jerry Muller, called Conservatism, an Anthology of Social and Political Thought from David Hume to the Present. And I thought, well, this is uh, strange. Uh, conservative thought? Who's, who's ever heard of such a thing? Because in his mind, this is what he said, as a lifelong liberal, I had always assumed that conservatism equals orthodoxy, which equals religion, which equals faith, which e equals a rejection of science. 
Then he goes on, though. He pulled the book off from the, from the shelf, started reading. He said, I started reading Muller's introduction while standing in the aisle. But by the third page, I had to sit down on the floor. He said, I was quite literally floored by the recognition that there was a kind of conservatism that could compete against liberalism in the court of social science. Now, Haidt did not become a conservative, but he started to appreciate some of its insights. He also started to recognize how his own education had been deficient, and then also how this affected his own teaching and scholarship, and why it was necessary to pr promote viewpoint diversity in the university. So he created an organization. I was one of the first 10 members, I think, of it, called uh, Heterodox Academy, a great organization designed to try to, to bring some, uh, some diversity, intellectual diversity, to, uh, to the campus. Now, I would like you to think, though, about whether or not Haidt's story could happen in reverse. That is, could you imagine a conservative professor wandering into a used bookstore and seeing an anthology of progressive thought, saying, oh my gosh, I had no idea. Uh, that these arguments were out there. I think, I think it's actually impossible to imagine that. It's just kind of the water that we swim in in, 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 in the university, the contemporary university. Um, I also think there's something important related to this regarding freedom of uh, speech as well. I think there's just woeful ignorance about basic free speech principles among college students, often among faculty and, and administrators. And if people just had a better understanding of this and they go out into the world being prepared and equipped with this knowledge about what the First Amendment actually requires, uh, they would uh, be in a much better position. And sometimes I think that these ideas, I actually know that these ideas are not presented accurately to students because because uh, faculty either uh, don't know them or they just simply don't want to discuss them uh, with, with their students. Now research, research, another core mission of the university, the production and dissemination of knowledge. I prefer just pursuit of truth, but we'll go with the production and dissemination of knowledge. Well, how is uh, viewpoint homogeneity, uh, how does it compromise this core mission of the university? There's many reasons, but I'll just focus on one. Just focus on one, confirmation bias. Confirmation bias. And this is the tendency that every single one of us have to accept findings and evidence that support our pre-existing position. And then to reject findings and evidence that tend to disconfirm those things. I, now I won't bring up a political example, but I'll give you an example from my own life that kind of captures this confirmation and uh, bias in action. Coffee. Uh, I drink a, an enormous amount of coffee. And I, I love it when I see these articles showing that drinking more coffee is good for you. It's like all my vices have turned into virtues. It's wonderful. I, I never look at the studies. There could be all sorts of problems with how they're structured. They could be convenient samples. I don't know what they could be, but I, I just accept them. And then if I see an article saying, well, there could be some drawbacks to this, <laughs> uh, obviously there must be something wrong with, uh, with, with, with this research because it doesn't support, my, doesn't support my preference. Now you can apply this to research in particularly the social sciences, humanities, but I also think in STEM fields, this can occur as well. If you end up with intellectual silos, uh, you're going to have difficulty rooting out error. And that's the problem with, that's the problem with con confirmation bias. Again, in question and answer, we can d discuss other uh, issues related to viewpoint diversity and the production of knowledge and trying to get at a closer approximation of, of the truth. Now, why do I think that uh, external influence that is outside the kind of the people who are all on campus every day is going to be necessary to, to pro promote these things? Give you some examples from some of my own research uh, and then uh, also what some, some, some others have said. So first, I, I did co-author a book uh, with a good friend of mine, John Shields, called Passing on the Right Conservative Professors in the Progressive University. We were interested in what's it like to be a conservative professor in different disciplines in the social sciences and humanities. And so we interviewed about 153 faculty in six different disciplines. For second person that we interviewed, he asked us what we were up to as a political scientist. And we told him, well, we want to interview about 150 uh, self-identified conservative or libertarian professors in the social sciences humanities. And he looked at us and he said, what are you going to do? Raise the dead? <laughs> a little bit of a joke, but he's right to ask the question. Give you an example. In sociology, there are about, well, there are about 6,000 sociologists in the United States. 6,000 sociologists in the United States. Uh, we found 12. 
who are willing to speak to us. Found 12. And in order to find people in several disciplines, we had to use what's called a snowball sample. And a snowball sample is something that you use with very difficult to locate populations. Uh, so for instance, the homeless. It's very commonly used when studying the homeless because the homeless, they don't have a fixed address, don't, probably don't have a publicly recorded phone number or something like that. So you find a homeless person and you say, hey, where can I find 10 more people like you? Uh, that's what we had to do to actually locate uh, people in a political minority on campus. Same method that you use to study the homeless. Uh, and I can tell you, by the way, when we I contacted them, some of them were deeply alarmed uh, that someone had reported them. And we had to walk them back from the ledge sometimes. Uh, but that captures some of this difficulty. So uh, why else might it, you, you just see kind of disciplinary capture where you just know in certain disciplines, it's just not gonna happen within the discipline. We also know that there's significant discrimination. This is, we, have, we have evidence of this, very good studies that have documented the willingness of faculty to discriminate against uh, political minorities. Now, I would actually include that when you look at political minorities today, it's not just people on the right. There are examples of, there's a professor at Brooklyn uh, College, Casey Johnson, who is in no sense a conservative, but a very distinguished historian who was denied tenure. Denied tenure. He was overturned by, I think, the Board of Trustees, uh, uh, but uh, he just happened to disagree with the hiring preferences of his department. Uh, so there is evidence though of, of discrimination and then there's also self-censorship. So even if you can find uh, sometimes people who dissent from the orthodoxy on campus, they will self-censor. And in that sense, they, they aren't doing much to help promote uh, a dissemination of different viewpoints. And we have good evidence that there's a significant degree of self-censorship on campus. Now, how also does this relate to civic education? Uh, I also think that universities are not going to do this on their own without some encouragement. And I'm just gonna quote from the president of Johns Hopkins, uh, Ron Daniels, who wrote a book recently called What Universities Owe Democracy? And where he essentially documents how higher education has done very little to correct this deficit of civic understanding, which then he also thinks leads to some of these other problems on campus, such as censoring others, shouting down others, canceling speakers, simply because they disagree with them. Here's what he said. If colleges had been successfully requiting their role in training citizens, one would expect to see evidence of the dramatic expansion in college attendance in the 20th century that had led to gains in the democratic capacities of the citizenry. If anything, there are signs of erosion on many of the key measures of democratic citizenship. Since we do see that erosion, uh, I'm very gladdened and uh, happy uh, that there are events like this where an entire state now uh, is taking this obligation that we have to the next generation quite seriously. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, I'm Philip Munoz. I teach at the University of Notre Dame, and I'm uh, very grateful to be part of this discussion on intellectual diversity on campus. Um, I have to confess, what I'd really like to talk about is how, I'm sure we all agree on this, uh, the college football season would be much improved if we shortened the game clock to 59 minutes and 59 <laughs> seconds. I lost a wager on that game, that's why I'm here in a gray sweater vest. <laughs> I'm not kidding about that. Um, I'm gonna start actually with two, apologi uh, two apologies. One, I have to catch a flight at 3.30, so I may have to leave before I'm able to talk to anyone afterwards. Secondly, I'm gonna privilege Ohio State um, University in my comments, and I, I know everyone here is not from Ohio State, so let me just acknowledge that. <clears throat> okay, if you go to the Ohio State University Office of Academic Affairs homepage, you'll find uh, Ohio State's mission uh, and their corresponding, university's corresponding principles and behaviors which are used to foster that mission. The mission says, among other things, that the mission is to, I'm quoting here, to advance the well-being of the people of Ohio and the global community through the creation and dissemination of knowledge. One of the principles to advance this mission is, I'm quoting again, encouraging open-minded exploration, risk-taking, and freedom of expression. Two behaviors uh, to accomplish and execute this mission are as follows, and I'm just gonna call them behavior one and behavior two. Behavior one, acknowledge and address individual and systemic effects of bias and discrimination. 
Behavior two, listen to multiple voices and engage in civil discourse. I think the reason there's so little intellectual diversity on campus is that many faculty, often the most vocal and activist faculty, many faculty believe that intellectual diversity is incompa incompatible with behavior one, with acknowledging and addressing individual and systemic effects of bias and discrimination. I think those faculty are incorrect, but from their point of view, and I wanna be as direct and blunt as possible, from their point of view, many faculty members, especially in colleges like my own, Arts and Letters or Arts and Sciences at Ohio State, many faculty believe that to acknowledge and address individual and systemic effects of bias and discrimination requires silencing, prohibiting, and eliminating politically and moral, morally conservative voices in individuals on campus. They believe to do behavior one is incompatible with intellectual diversity. And until you fully understand and digest the implications of that, you will never have a campus in which multiple voices are listened to and where open-minded exploration and risk-taking are encouraged. What you will have instead is what most leading American universities have become, one-sided, narrowly partisan political organizations that's, that are not inclusive of non-leftist voices. Simply put, faculty, not all, but many, don't want intellectual diversity, and you have to understand that. Let me give you an example from my own campus. One of our highest ranking officials was asked about the subtleties of racism on campus. She was asked whether racism is always explicit or overt. Oh, no, she said, of course not. Covert racism, she said, is, a, is the real problem. So she was asked to give an example of covert or subtle racism on campus. And she provided the following example. The idea that the Constitution is colorblind. And she listed Clarence Thomas as an example of someone who falls into this. Now, I'm a professor of constitutional law. When I teach the Supreme Court cases on affirmative action, how can I encourage open-minded exploration, risk-taking, freedom of expression among my students when one of my university's highest ranking officials says that one side of the debate is racist? If you Google Ohio State University and color blindness, you will find a 2017 story published by the Ohio State Insight. I presume that's an official university publication. The story highlights the research of an Ohio State professor who published a book arguing, and I'm quoting here from the story, color blindness of any variety is harmful because it does not recognize the myriad problems of minorities face in our society. That's the standard view among faculty. But let me translate what that means in practice. If you hold what many people hold, what the Supreme Court now holds, what the law of the land is, that a proper interpretation of, of our law, the principle of equality, what used to be a mainstream view, that is it's colorblind, a professor at Ohio State University, highlighted by your own publications, says you are harmful to society. I should be clear, I actually think there are good arguments for affirmative action. I myself have mixed views on the subject. I think the subject constitutionally is a tough call. Um, I think all sides of the debate should be heard out. But when one side of the debate the side with all the power says, your arguments are harmful and racist, there's no way you're gonna get open and free inquiry. So let me be clear about the points I wish to communicate to you. First, many faculty don't want intellectual diversity. That's why we have the universities we have. Secondly, faculty hire faculty. An ideological partisan faculty will never balance itself out. Indeed, the current trends are only getting worse. If you expect faculty to correct this problem, you're a fool. My third and final point. If you actually want to, I'm quoting again, the mission of Ohio State University, to advance the well-being of all the people of Ohio, 
and the global community through the creation and dissemination of knowledge, and you truly want to encourage the principle of open-minded exploration, risk-taking, and freedom of expression, you can't simply defer to faculty for hiring faculty. To make public universities like those in Ohio truly inclusive will require outside leadership. It will require your leadership. Leadership that current faculty members and current administrators cannot and will not provide. Thank you. I have been called a white supremacist <laughs> by white people. Now, I don't know if you have realized this or not, but I am black. <laughs> Can the people in the back see that I'm black? I just want to make sure. Okay, got it? All right, good. Fantastic. So, less dramatically, I've also been uh, called conservative as a slur, right? Um, but the thing is, I've never identified as conservative um, in my life. Um, there's nothing wrong with being a conservative. Uh, I um, have always seen myself as a left-leaning moderate. Um, but today, that means I'm a Nazi. I haven't changed one bit. Um, the academy, however, um, and the voices therein, especially the powerful voices, um, have gotten more powerful. And um, that's why I am here today. I'm called these things because of a concept called prescriptive racism. What is this? Prescriptive racism is, well, when someone has a script and prescribes characteristics onto you, and if you don't embrace those characteristics, there's something wrong with you. You're inauthentic. Um, as a member of uh, your race or something like that. Um, we have a certain narrative that is victim-oriented, uh, oppressor versus oppressed. You can guess who the oppressor is and who the oppressed are, right? And by nature of being a narrative, it has a script. And in that script, there's no role for me. I am a person of color who appreciates some classical liberal values like the primacy of reason, individuality, free speech, equality before the law. For these things, I'm called, um, at best, a conservative. I believe in the power of deliberative democracy. What I mean by that is um, the ideas don't sell them themselves in the marketplace, right? We have a marketplace of ideas. We are the ones who um, put those ideas out there, who scrutinize those ideas. That is how America is supposed to work. Teaching that, te teaching deliberative rhetoric, I am a rhetorician uh, by trade, um, is considered itself an act of oppression because these are values derived from Eurocentric origins that we are expecting from students of color. Um, a specific example of that in my field is the demonization of standard English, um, specifically written standard English. Now, one of the reasons I've been called a white supremacist, actually this was the first reason, is because I dared say that standard English might come in handy um, in civic and professional contexts sometime in the students' lives. Um, now and after they graduate. So maybe they should have that skill somewhere, whether they actually use it or not, I don't know, but they should probably have it. I'm Hitler, all right? That's, uh, where the, that's where my field is anyway. That's where the academy is more generally, um, as um, my two colleagues have already said. A leader in my field, a prominent leader, one could say the leader in my field, um, has said several times that teaching standardized English to people of color, especially black people, is a form of racism. Nothing practical about it. Now, my respect for pragmatism is also something that gets me called a white supremacist um, uh, at worst. 
my colleague, the prominent person in the field, will tell you that any student of color who wants to learn standard English anyway is being, quote, selfish and immature because they're only thinking of themselves and not the various other people out there who need to be saved. This again is prescriptive racism. Why? Because he is looking at a person's skin color and deciding what they know, who they are, what they believe in, what they value. And he's also assuming that people who look like that person has the same um, values, uh, dreams, hopes, thoughts, aspirations. Prescriptive racism is baked into contemporary anti-racism. Right? I'll say that again. Prescriptive racism is baked into contemporary anti-racism. You cannot have contemporary anti-racism without prescriptive racism. There is a script that has to be followed. If you do not follow it, you are demonized, you are marginalized, you are kicked out, you are called a white supremacist regardless of your skin color. So was that an applaud? What? Okay. <laughs> um, so I'll try to wrap up now um, because I can talk about this all day and uh, let you know that I'm trying to fight this, not from the inside out. That's not going to happen. And that's already been mentioned. We have to, uh, you know, um, my idea was to get out there, round up the cavalry and come back and save the day. Um, I'm still trying to do that to some extent. That's one of the reasons why I'm here. Um, but I'm also the president and co-founder of an organization called Free Black Thought. Um, and the mission of Free Black Thought is to fight prescriptive racism, is to let people know that there is intellectual diversity within black America, right? There are 40 million black Americans. There are, there are 40 million ways to be black, right? That's how we look at it. So we publish voices that are not heard in the mainstream, um, black intellectuals who uh, you wouldn't think exist because, well, the mainstream media won't tell you that, they won't acknowledge that. Um, we have a podcast with the same principles, a compendium of authors uh, who don't fit the script I mentioned earlier. And um, we're trying to grow and we're trying to get out there and we're trying to uh, have a presence in as many college campuses as possible and put on some symposia, something like this. Um, so that's out there and we're trying, but we have to try because academia, unfortunately, seems to be lost. My field especially, my field is rhetoric and composition. It's more accurately called woke studies. That's a more accurate label for my field now. Something has to happen outside of the field. I was, you, you were talking about Jonathan Haidt. Um, I was telling him about my field and how I wanted to save it. And he said, it's too late. <laughs> it's gone, you have to do something else, right? And I didn't want to believe him at the time. I, I was in denial, but he was right. So we're trying to do something else. And one last thing, <laughs> if you want to have affirmative action in higher education, it should be for moderates and conservatives. Hello, I'm Dorian and I am a deplorable. Uh, I became a deplorable by arguing uh, publicly that in an academic context, we should treat every person as an individual worthy of dignity and respect. Uh, and we should do that by making, uh, doing admissions and hiring on the basis of academic merit and by promoting freedom of expression uh, on campus. And as a result, uh, a number of students tried to get me fired from the University of Chicago. And I had a, a big lecture at MIT canceled. And so that's why I'm here. I'm a scientist, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the problems that are happening in science and how uh, intellectual diversity is implicated. So the most important thing I think is, is on the intake. So we just heard from Eric about uh, 
affirmative action for conservatives. I, I, I don't think I would go there, but I would try to dismantle the systems that are, uh, that are preventing conservatives pr from participating in the scientific pursuit. And so one thing we heard about this morning is DEI statements, and these are sort of ideological tests that are screening out people. Uh, there was a study cited on this panel about willingness to discriminate against conservatives. Uh, that's, I think the study that was referenced is, Eric, is by Eric Kaufman, but uh, faculty will openly admit in surveys that they will discriminate against conservatives in hiring. Uh, and that they refuse to have lunch with someone who is pro-life or voted for Trump or associate with them in any way, for example. Um, and then this sort of continues down the line with things. So if someone comes out with heterodox opinions, then they'll be disinvited from giving seminars. They'll be uh, have trouble getting tenure and uh, people won't collaborate with them, it becomes difficult to get grants. So these are sort of the ways that this starts to affect the scientific pursuit. Eventually it can lead to corruption of the science itself. So I've recently seen uh, some, a seminar on decolonial feminist science. And what that means is you apply the scientific method, but if it leads to a conclusion that's inconsistent with feminist or decolonialist theory, then that negates the scientific method. And so that's, that's a pretty basic corruption of, of the scientific process, and that's becoming popular now. And so we've sort of reached, reached that point. And these are the sorts of things that you should be aware of and concerned about. And I'd like to talk about a couple potential steps in the right direction. So the first is, I think we heard about the, Cal the Calvin Report earlier, uh, and I'd like to make that more explicit. So this is a report from the University of Chicago uh, by Mr. Calvin, was the chair of, of the committee. And the idea is that it forbids the university as a corporate body from taking positions on social and political issues. So the president can't come out and say, oh, the Supreme Court ruled this, but we're against it for this or that reason. And this is important because if the president does that, it has the effect that a dissenting scholar is afraid to speak out. And the purpose of this is to promote the individual faculty members uh, expressing their view. And the, the basis for this is the conception of the university as a community of scholars, no more, no less. And so it's not a, a kindergarten and it's not a religious organization or a political party. It's a community of scholars that are meant to fight out the ideas. And that uh, Calvin institutional neutrality doctrine has to go all the way down to the deans and the department chairs. And so no one in an official capacity should be making a statement on social and political issues. So I think that's a good step that you can try to get something like that adopted at your universities. And you can try to choose presidents who buy into it. And, you know, they don't feel like uh, they have to be reminded of it, but they say they want to do that. They want to lead an institution where the people underneath them are engaged in the debate, not them. Another issue is DEI statements. So statements on hiring uh, in completely unrelated fields like science where people are asked to make ideological commitments in order to be hired. These are often screened by uh, administrators before the faculty can even look at the applications. And so if you have 100 applicants, typically about 75 of them will be, uh, won't make it to the faculty at schools that are using these DEI screens because their DEI statement was not sufficiently uh, favorable of, of DEI. And so, for example, what I've been arguing, which is that each person should be treated as an individual, that would uh, get an application thrown out before it even gets to the faculty. And so th that's something you should be aware of in trying to do something about. Um, is there anything else I should talk about? I think that's, that's enough for now. Well, th thank you all for these rich insights. I want to make sure that we have um, sufficient audience time. Senator, about how late should we go? Uh, we have time for a few questions. Okay, but I, I want to ask one, um, for panel discussion first, we've begun to touch on the really important question of solutions. And since we have um, the bold trustees who have come to this summit, 
Could we go right down the panel? What are the things that you would advise or maybe even prescribe for trustees to take up at board meetings? I guess since I'm on, I'm on the far right, I'll begin. Um, the faculty are gonna tell you that, um, in one way or another, that you're clueless. And you have no business telling faculty how to hire faculty. And, and they mean it, that's what they think. Um, you have a responsibility. The, the faculty think they, the university is for them. The university is for the people of Ohio. And you're their trustees, you're the people's trustees. And you have to stand up to the faculty. Now, it, it might be that you're not on the search committee, but ultimately you decide is this department, is this program, is this area of study worth the taxpayer, the, the people of Ohio's taxpayer money? And faculty say, well, no, that's, that's if, you, if you shut down a department, that's violation of freedom of expression. And your response should be, you can go say all you want, but you have no right to have a department. So you have to exercise oversight in your capacity, which is to decide which departments get funded, which programs exist, and you have to do so in light of the interest of the people of Ohio, not the faculty's own interest. So I would re reiterate the point about institutional neutrality. I think that is crucial. Uh, there's a good article written by the Chancellor of Vanderbilt, Daniel Deermeyer, in the Chronicle of he Higher Education just this past spring. Uh, he happens to be on the board of the Institute of American Civics. I'm also happy to report. But he wrote, wrote an article talking about the importance of freedom of speech, a strong commitment to freedom of speech, uh, also a strong commitment to civil discourse and then to try to model civil discourse on campus for students so they can actually see people with different positions actually exercising the, their, their free speech rights in a productive and effective way. Sometimes the students just, they, they don't see it. All they, all they see is the shouting. Uh, but then ultimately institutional neutrality uh, where again the university shouldn't be in the business of putting the thumb, its thumb on the scale of campus uh, dialogue. And I, I think that what's happened, you can see some of this the past two weeks. I think there are some, uh, some chancellors and presidents who are belatedly coming to the recognition that maybe they should, that should have been their policy all along. Ask for definitions. When we hear terms like diversity, equity, and inclusion, we assume, all right, those are great things. Why would we be against that? Well, if you ask for the definitions and you get an honest answer, it might not be what you think. Diversity does not include diversity of thought, as you can infer from this panel. Inclusion means don't say anything that could possibly offend somebody else. Um, maybe you've heard the term microaggression, um, an, an inadvertent insult on somebody, right? Like um, asking where they're from. Now, perhaps that is motivated by um, racist thinking, but perhaps it isn't. You don't know until you ask, until you talk to the person. That's what inclusion means now. Um, equity means equality of outcome and not opportunity. So, and, and race, and racism, ask about that. Those, defini those, those definitions have changed, and I can tell you, if you want to truly inform and make society better, you don't take a word with a standard definition that's been present for decades, change that definition, and then yell at people for getting it wrong, right? That is not trying to inform, that's trying to confuse, that's trying to marginalize, that's trying to wrest power uh, from people. Ask for definitions, don't assume, do not assume. Ask for definitions. So I want to talk for a moment about shutting down departments because that's come up a couple of times. The first thing I'd like to say is uh, be careful not to have too economic of an outlook. So the mission of the university is not to maximize profits. And there are some departments that should exist whether or not they're making money. Uh, so that should at least be taken into account. Now, of course, ideas like if there's five universities nearby, maybe only one needs this department or something like this. That, that, those sorts of practical considerations should be taken into account, but 
uh, it wouldn't make sense to have a university that doesn't have a history department just because it's not making enough money. And typically in universities, the standard way they operate is the business school is going to take in a lot of money and then other areas are going to run at a loss. And that's because it's a mission maximizing institution. Now, if, but it is important to close certain departments down, uh, particularly because a lot of the problems that we're talking about have originated in specific departments. And if you want to try to find which ones those might be, I would look for things that have the word critical and studies in their uh, names. So anything that has critical and or studies in the name of the department, look very carefully into uh, you know, what they're doing and whether you want them on your campus. Okay, thank you for that. And uh, if I may take the prerogative as moderator to point people on, on the back table is a little card called the Act of Gold Standard, 20 criteria for creating a campus that's devoted to freedom. There are specific things that boards can do um, when um, searching for a president. Ask for the record on cultivating intellectual diversity. That ought to be a question for candidates. Uh, attend the heterodox activities on campus when a controversial speaker is there. Be there. M model the behavior. Tenure and promotion. Does the board have any role except rubber stamping these extremely expensive decisions? Do you all see summaries of the votes pro and con for tenure or the denial of tenure? And if you discover something like the Casey Johnson affair where a brilliant scholar and researcher is being railroaded because of a perfectly legitimate opinion, then you have the prerogative of intervening. And finally, uh, dare I say the nuclear option, a department that is not keeping up the standards of integrity and freedom could well go into receivership. Uh, that sort of thing, studies or critical, whatever it might be, if it is not living up to its mission, you as arbiters of quality have a prerogative of interceding. Well, I've probably spoken too much already at moderator. Do we have time for a few questions? Uh, any couple quick questions? Please. Sorry, we're, we're out of microphones, so we have to just speak up for everybody. Project, yes. Hi, um, my name is What I'm, what I'm wondering is, listening to um, the concerns of, you know, might, if, if we're taking labels, you might label me as that, that, that leftist, or someone might also say, um, you know, you're leftist and you are also um, uh, a cause of conservative, you know, um, the blend of the two. But um, listening to that, listening to your comments, it was lead me to believe that you're suggesting that even when we are looking at property, that it really should be through a lens of trying to help, um, I'm going to call it, contain the leftist, leftist culture on the university. Um, when I think about banning books or, or uh, calling out leftist uh, faculty, aren't we doing the same thing? Aren't we suppressing academic freedom as compared to really supporting the truth of academic freedom, which allows all sides to have a place, have a position, have a voice, and to be able to work through issues? Um, I would never want to suppress anybody's um, you know, academic freedom, um, especially if they don't agree with me. I want to hear about that. That's, uh, I'm a professor of rhetoric. I'd be a bad one if I didn't want to see that. I'm all about deliberation. We value our ideas by putting them out there and having them scrutinized, right? And um, hearing what's wrong with them and what is right with them. Um, I would never want to suppress anybody. The issue is that there are certain ideas that are just not allowed to be said. Um, diversity statements, they've been talked about throughout this panel. They're not allowed to be diverse. Diversity statements are not diverse. If Frederick Douglass wrote a diversity statement, it would be rejected. 
If Martin Luther King wrote a diversity statement, it would be rejected. It does not, yes, it would. Yes, it would. I, I, can, I can show you these people who would reject it. It would be rejected. What? Uh, okay. Um, the idea is that there is certain, um, a, actually, I, I don't want to get too into it, but uh, certain uh, Marxist-oriented ideas that are more acceptable than anything else. And if you don't abide by those, then you are not writing the correct diversity statement. There are now citational diversity statements. If you don't cite enough people of color, you won't get accepted in a journal. That's where we are. So one more question. Can I add one thing about that? Please, yeah. yeah. I mean, you're sort of pointing to a general issue with liberalism, which is what do you do in a liberal framework with a group of people who use their freedom to attack liberalism itself? And I think that's kind of the real danger. Uh, and it's, it's a bit of an unresolved question. Where I sit on it is allow people to argue against the liberal framework, but if they take actions to shut down the speech of other people, then you have to prevent them. And I think the presidents need to show a little bit more of a muscular response when students showed up, show up to shut down other people's speech or when they try to uh, get something canceled. So in, in my personal experience, some graduate students tried to get me fired from the University of Chicago and the president just said, no, we don't do that here. And that was the end of it. And then at MIT, some graduate students tried to get my lecture canceled and the administrators there said, okay, we're doing it. But so all you need is, is someone at the top just saying, look, we respect everybody's ability to speak on issues and uh, that's how we do things here. So I'm, I'm gonna, let me jump in here because I want to disagree with Josh on something here. And he was talking about um, uh, institutional neutrality. I don't think these institutions should be neutral. They should be partisans of the discovery of truth. Right, and, and that's what should be guiding these institutions. These institutions are devoted to the discovery and teaching of truth. And all who are open, that requires a epistemic humility. Those people who are absolutely convinced that they know the truth will try to shut down other people. And that's the attitude that where we may disagree on all sorts of things, but that's what we have in common. And so you don't shut down speakers. I want to so by institutional neutra neutrality, I just mean the uh, administration or departments making official statements on whatever the issue of the day is. I think that should be, uh, they, they shouldn't be doing that because then that's what shapes uh, campus discourse. But if they, you're, you're absolutely right. Universities cannot be neutral about the pursuit of truth. Otherwise, there's something else. Uh, they aren't a university. Uh, but uh, I, don't know what, I don't know what they would be. But if, if they don't actually have a bias towards that, then they've compromised their core, core function. Usually as, they turn into second-rate NGOs. As, um, as chair, I'm going to take one more um, uh, prerogative. Search committees. It would be unthinkable now to have a search committee that was all made up of Caucasian males. Properly so. We, we stress in search committees getting a certain diversity of viewpoints. Well, no, we don't do viewpoints. How many searches for a new economist or political scientist would actually um, make it a stipulation that there had to be a classical liberal or a conservative on the search committee? I, I've not heard of that being done. So we're very good at the idea of saying that we should have a, um, one type of diversity, but not intellectual diversity. I just wanted to share that conundrum. Do we have time for one more question? I think we need to move. Okay. So let me thank all of you for extraordinary discussion and the audience for your patience and also an apology that we don't have another hour to keep at this.